In 1960, Hilka Hilevi Saarinen was living with her husband Penty Franz Olavi Saarinen out in the peaceful but cold village of Krotala in Kokomaki in Finland. Everyone who met Hilka described her as a sweet and caring woman, and from the outside looking in, she appeared to have it all. By the time Hilka had turned only 33, she and Penty had had five children together. They'd taken out a loan and bought out her siblings' share of the family home and now owned all of it. And her husband also had a good job. Penty was a stonemason, a trade with bright prospects and one that was always in need in the rural farming village that they were living in. But what started as an almost picturesque story quickly turned sour when Penty started drinking. The changes happened slowly at first, with Penty only really drinking a few beers with friends at local pubs in the village, but once he'd had a taste, there was no going back. Penty started drinking far more heavily, and before anyone knew it, he was spending most of the family's income on drink, and taking out his frustrations on his wife. He complained that she was a poor housekeeper and a terrible cook, not even taking into account that he'd spent almost everything they'd had on alcohol rather than food, and his family were left living in fear of his wrath, with little to nothing to eat, and often nothing to warm the house in a country that's notorious for its harsh winters and snowy weather. According to some reports, pushes and shoves turned into punches and kicks, and then they went even further. Villagers would report seeing Hilka around town with bruises, but what they didn't know was exactly how far things had gone behind closed doors. There are stories of Penty shoving Hilka's head into a bucket of feces, and another that said that he had stabbed her with a fork because he thought she'd, quote, eaten like a pig at the dinner table. The rumours kept circulating around the village about Penty and his terrible, abusive behaviour towards Hilka, but it was far harder to do something about her situation, especially when she had five children living at the home with her and they were starting to show signs of serious malnourishment. Complaints about the children's deteriorating conditions led to the authorities coming into the home and taking all of them away to live in foster care instead. And though it can be argued that it was good for the children to be removed from their home, it also meant that Hilka was left entirely alone with the man who was abusing her. With no witnesses to really hold him back anymore, Hilka was seen around the village again with more and more bruises, but there was someone in her life who was determined not to forget her. Her eldest child, Seppo, was about 13 at the time and was growing into a bright young man. That year, he managed to travel back to the family home, saying that he was going to bring a classmate with him and wanted to spend Christmas with his parents, but he was also planning something special for them too. Seppo showed up the day before he told his parents to expect him, wanting to surprise his mother and be able to spend more time with her, but when Seppo and his friend walked up to the wooden cabin that was Seppo's home, they were in for an unusual evening. There was no sign of anyone outside, but the front door was unlocked, so the two boys went in thinking that they were about to give Seppo's parents a nice surprise. They did surprise someone, though whether it was a nice surprise or not can't really be said, because only Penty was in the house and he came racing out of the kitchen, shouting that Seppo was early. Penty locked the kitchen door behind him and directed the boys into another room, saying that he could only afford to heat the one room, so they would all be staying in there, but he didn't say anything about Hilka or where she was. Eventually, Seppo realised that something was off and asked Penty where Hilka was, and Penty told the boys that she had gone. Some reports say that Penty said that Hilka had disappeared while Penty had been off putting fuel in the sauna, and some say that he'd said that they'd gone to bed together and she was gone when he'd woken up. But what both versions have in common is that it was Hilka who'd left the house and Penty. Despite the horrible way his father treated his mother, Seppo was still surprised to hear that she would have just left Penty, especially without saying a word, and he certainly didn't think that she would have gone far if she had. 
Seppel thought that Hilke could have gone to a house where she would sometimes work to make extra money for the family, but Penty immediately shut this down, saying that even when Hilke had said that she was working at that house, she had been lying. This didn't sit right with Seppo, but nothing seemed out of place about the house or even with his father, who, despite the harsh things he had to say about Hilke, didn't seem to be acting any differently than usual. That was until it was time for everyone to go to bed, and they had to bring in some extra blankets from the back bedroom. The only way through to that room was through the kitchen, and Penty unlocked the door, keeping a close eye on the boys as they walked through the room and collected what they needed, but almost immediately that feeling that something wasn't quite right came back to Seppo. Penty refused to turn on the light in the kitchen, saying that it was broken and the boys would just have to find their way in the dark, but the light in the hallway was on and with that light, Seppo could see that the kitchen was a mess. There was a large stone oven in the kitchen, one that had actually spread out between two rooms and could actually warm both of them, but he also knew that his parents hadn't used it in about eight years. This meant that over time, the oven turned into an extra bit of storage space and became the home for many objects and utensils, but for whatever reason, all of those objects were now strewn all over the kitchen floor. Seppo asked Penty why that was, and Penty told him that he'd had to move all of them so that he could clean the oven, but why would Penty suddenly decide to clean the oven when no one had used it for almost a decade? Seppo couldn't figure that out, so his mind kept coming back to it, and he couldn't shake this nagging feeling that something was wrong. After the boys had seen the state that the kitchen was in, Penty began to watch them even closer, making sure that they didn't try to go into any other room in the house and watching them through the windows whenever they went outside. After only a day, Seppo's friend cut his trip short and went home early, but Seppo stayed, trying to get more out of his father or at least figure out what he was up to. Aside from his missing mother, the mess in the kitchen and a missing patch of sand from outside the cattle shed, everything around the house seemed normal, at least the parts that Seppo had access to, so he was left without answers. He knew his father was abusive, and had, in drunken rages, threatened to kill his mother, but there was also a chance that she had finally had enough of him and had run away, so Seppel let things be, spending what was left of the holidays in that house with his father and going back to his foster home after. But days turned into weeks, and then months, and no one had heard from Hilka, and both Seppel and the people living in the village began to suspect that something else was going on. The villagers reported Hilke as missing, and Seppo kept making trips out to the cabin, spending days at a time going through the house and looking for any clues, even tracing the walls with his fingers to check for hidden seams and searching the stone foundations, but nothing came of it. The police came to speak with Penty, who said that he had no idea where Hilke was and that she had just left him during the night, and Seppo began to lose hope that he would ever find out what happened to his mother. That was until he had a look in the stone oven in the kitchen. For the most part, it looked like it always had, but then Seppo spotted a few rows of bricks along the top of it that looked significantly newer than the others. He knew that if anyone would have been able to pull that oven apart and put it back together again, it would have been his father, the stonemason. The only question was why he would do that. Feeling like he was onto something, Seppo wrote to the police and asked them to take a look at the oven, but he heard nothing back. In 1966, he once again wrote a letter to them, a full six years after Hilke had gone missing, and asked them one more time to take a harder look at that oven. He wrote, I suspect that my father knows more about the disappearance of my mother than he has told me. He has clearly opened the oven and shut it again. However, the oven had not been used in seven to eight years before this. My father was cleaning in the dark, even though another room was lit when I arrived. I think the oven should be dismantled. My father could do anything. But Seppel's plea fell on deaf ears again, even after he wrote to the press the following year and tried to put public pressure on the police to work on this case. But all this did was create more tension between father and son. The next time Penty and Seppo met, Penty warned Seppo and told him to stop while he was ahead, suggesting that both men, quote, mind our own business. But Seppo kept pushing, even when it took until 1972 for Hilke's case to be officially reopened. 
A new police chief came in with the goal of relooking at cold cases, and Hilkas was one of the ones at the top of the pile, especially when law enforcement came by the letter that Seppo had sent to them over six years prior. Detectives reached out to Seppo and asked him more about his mother and father, and during the interview they showed him Pente's official statement to the police. The statement didn't say much, especially because Penty had stuck to his story that Hilka had just disappeared, but Seppo noticed enough discrepancies between it and his own versions of events for the investigators to finally go to the house and open up the oven. On Hilka's birthday, November 27th, 1972, law enforcement arrived at the cabin and took the oven apart. They found nothing unusual at first, but as they dug their way down, they found a pile of sand. Only a little way into that, investigators came across a rubber boot, and when they pulled it out, a foot came with it. Hilka had been inside the oven for over 12 years. She'd been there that first Christmas that Seppo had visited. She'd been there during all the searches, and when the police had first come to speak with Penty, and now she was finally found. The combination of the sand and the environment inside the oven had almost mummified her body, including her clothes. She'd been dressed like she was heading outside, including her boots and woolen gloves on her hands, and Seppo was able to come in and positively identify her remains over a decade after she died. But what the oven didn't preserve was enough physical evidence to prove exactly how she died. Knowing that, they probably wouldn't get their answer unless Penty confessed, and thinking that they had enough circumstantial evidence to try him, the authorities took Penty to court. Penty denied everything, even going as far as to come up with a story of his house being robbed by gypsies the day before Seppo had arrived, but everyone saw through him. The court agreed that Penty had killed Hilka and hidden her body in the oven, but what it couldn't agree on was whether Penty had done it intentionally or by accident. Thinking that it was possible that her death could have been an accident and the result of a drunken bout of violence gone too far, they tried him with manslaughter and sentenced him to eight years in prison. But there's still another twist in this story. The Supreme Court reviewed Penty's case and sentence and determined that there wasn't enough physical evidence to back up the conviction. No one could prove how Hilka had died, therefore no one could prove that Penty had actually killed her, and his sentence was overturned. Even though everyone knew that Penty had killed his wife, he was suddenly a free man and allowed to return home to the very same house he'd lived in with her corpse for 12 years. He remained there for the rest of his life, living in squalor until he drank himself into an early grave in 1986. He died at the age of 66, and when others returned to the property after his death, they found that the oven was still exactly the way that the police had left it all those years ago. Penty had lived in that same house, judging by the rubble and the mess left behind, mostly in that very same room as the dismantled brick oven he'd once used to cover his tracks and hide his wife's body in.